Hello guys, welcome. You made it. Let's let's go. Let's do this together.
Thank you for the cross. God, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy in our lives. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Welcome once again, and let's continue with our online service. All right, blessings to all of you, all of the Cornerstone Online community, wherever you are, some of you here in San Francisco, some of you in other parts of the Bay Area, other parts of the country, some cases other parts of the world, some of you are traveling, some of you are on vacation, some of you actually are joining us for the very first time. Maybe you were told by a friend or uh, a family member, or, or you were searching, you found us. There are no coincidences. I don't believe that. I think you're here for a reason. 
And I want to welcome you, if this is you, joining us now for the very first time. I'm Pastor Terry. I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. And I hope that you will be so strengthened and encouraged. You know, we are continuing on with, as many of you are aware, our summer series. It's called Abide. It has to do with staying connected to Jesus. This idea of cultivating a very healthy, growing inner life. How God invites us to have more than just a surface level faith, but a faith that has deep roots. A faith that is sustainable, even when things are hard. Now today we're going to be hearing from one of our Cornerstone teaching team members, Vincent Nell. Some of you know Vinny's story. He shared it a few weeks back. You can check that out as well. Uh, if you want to go back and revisit it, it was very touching and hopeful as he shared out of his real pain. But Vinny, in addition to a number of responsibilities he has here at Cornerstone, whether it's overseeing our productions or our artistic expressions, is also a lover of film and uh, he, he loves to create uh, videos as well. And one of the things that he's going to do, and we're going to share it in a moment, is open up his time of sharing with a special piece that he prepared as a lead in. So with that in mind, here we go. I started running in 2001. I did marathons, you know, two or three a year. And at, finally in, in 2003, I went on a backpacking trip with three friends to Mount Whitney. You're at 14,500, just on top of the Sierras. There was, there was somebody up there who was just sort of talking about this race. The Badwater Ultra Marathon is a 135 mile road race uh, beginning at Badwater Basin, which is the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere. So it's 282 below sea level, incredibly hot during the, during the summertime and goes over three different, uh, three different mountains. And it finishes with a climb, with about a over 5,000 foot climb over 12 miles, uh, halfway up Mount Whitney from Lone Pine, which is the small town at the base of uh, Mount Whitney in the, in the Sierra. So where the road ends is where the, the, race, the race itself ends. There was just an attraction to wanting to challenge myself. And at a time when life itself was, was challenging me, I ultimately put together a, a support crew of 13 people. It's easy to look at an endeavor like that and to think it's all about you, but it's not. My crew is there to make sure that you, we optimize what you're doing so that you can endure for the entire race. Because the idea isn't just to endure for 30 miles or 60 miles or 100 miles. The idea is to endure for the whole 135. So now I'm at the starting line. It's already warm. It's already about 100 degrees, I think, at that time, 6 a.m., well, maybe a little bit hotter. I've put all these people into all these roles. What that did is that freed me up to just be the runner. All I have to do is run. There's no noise, there's, there's nothing to distract. There's just the sound of your heartbeat, the sound of your lungs. There's two things I'm trying to focus on. One is, is what do I have right in front of me? But then the other hand is the hope that comes from the insurance of what's at the end somehow or another that those two things help to fix or ground you in terms of where you're at right now. When you feel like you're pulling in the finish, it feels tremendously different than when you're pulling away from a starting place. I got to, I got to mile 107, I got to the small town Keeler out there, and all of a sudden I, uh, I pulled my hamstring. I was livid. You know, I've got 28 miles to go, and I'm like, oh my god, like, I can't do this for 28 miles. Well, what are you going to do? Are you going to stop? Are you going to quit? When you suffer and when you hurt, it, it tends to bring all those things, the mental, emotional, spiritual things that are really raw to the surface in a way that being in comfort, I think, doesn't do. You know, if I quit here, if you quit at that point, it's you're short-circuiting the journey. Who's to say, who's to say what I'm going to feel like? five miles down the road, or 10 miles down the road, or 15 miles down the road, because your perspective changes. Nothing inside of me ever wanted to stop. The two most important things was, you know, was that there was a finish line, and that 
I wanted, I wanted to be there. I wanted to uh, experience the, the joy of finishing. I've been on the starting line eight times, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to say I've finished all eight this past year, uh, 2021, where I finished in ninth place overall. Sometimes we feel like the things in our life are, um, are unique to just us. Becoming spiritually grounded is designed not to give you the answers for every moment or every trial or challenge you find yourself in, but it's to prepare yourself to adapt in those moments. You can change your arc of, of your life, of where you're headed, about where you're going, and you know, it, it starts in a moment and it, it feels like, you know, may feel like it's not possible or it's too far away, but it is, and to have that kind of influence to me is, is, um, is pretty awesome. I recently started running. I am nowhere near in the league that Jonathan Gunderson is that we just heard from, but this is a big deal for me. I'm usually known as an anti-runner or even someone who is opposed to any kind of exercise generally. I, people would say to me who run how they enjoy it and I should run and I'd say, why? The cons far outweigh the pros. You get hot and sweaty and smelly and you feel tired and gross afterwards. If you take a wrong step, you could fall and twist your ankle or break a bone. Uh, eventually, if you run your whole life, you're probably going to need a knee replacement on both your knees. So no thanks. Why would I run? I'm quite happy lying on the couch, watching Netflix, eating an entire chocolate cake. Thank you very much. You do you. I'm a do me. But I am now at the age where lying on the couch, watching Netflix and eating an entire chocolate cake has consequences for my body and my health. And so I had been considering uh, becoming a little more active in my life and I wasn't sure what that would look like. But thankfully we live in a very algorithmic world. And so scrolling on Instagram one day, up popped a targeted personal ad in my face for a virtual Lord of the Rings marathon. And I'm a big Lord of the Rings nerd, and so this was too good for me to say no to. And so I signed up. And so basically what happens is they give you this app that gives you a digital map of Middle Earth and it tracks the journey of Frodo and Sam going from Hobbiton all the way through Middle Earth to Mount Doom to destroy the Ring of Power. And you've been tasked with the quest of destroying the Ring. They actually send you the uh, one ring, a replica of it, once you reach Rivendell. I'm so far from Rivendell, I haven't even left the Shire yet, but that's pretty cool too. And there are five legs to this virtual marathon. And at the, each of end, at the end of each leg, they send you a custom Lord of the Rings medal. So I'm super excited. I really want these medals and I really want the replica of the Lord of the Rings, so I sign up to do it. You can see here my progress. I am 10 miles in. Woohoo! Now, the first leg is 145 miles, so I'm so far from finishing it. But the good thing is that you can do it at your own pace. You can take as long as you want, and you just upload it whenever you run. Um, and this is a big deal for me because 10 miles, which I've run this month, is more than I've run my entire life. So this app really is working for me. You just need to have a prize that you want, and then it'll get you off the couch, I guess. And so now I run. On Wednesdays, I run, just like the Mean Girls wear pink. And so when I heard Jonathan speak of his marathon, I kept thinking about all the spiritual principles that can be applied to the way that he approaches his running. And I kept hearkening back to the verse in Hebrews that talks about our faith life as a marathon. And so I want to look at that today. I want to look at it in terms of the context from which it was written, and then I want us to take some principles and apply it to our own lives. 
Anytime you embark on a quest or a journey or a race, you need to train and you need to repair. And so I'd like us to consider this time that we share together a training or preparation for the race of faith that we are going to encounter in the days ahead. The passage I'm going to read is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. It is the NIV version, which is my favorite version. And because I'm in charge today, I get to pick the version. Here we go. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And so, Lord, I invite you into this time today. May you speak to us the word you have prepared for each of us in the unique race that we have set before us. I pray that um, you provide us with all the tools we need in our lives to endure this race that you've given us. I pray that we will remember that you are with us. I pray that you will open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits to receive whatever it is that you will have for us, Lord. Thank you that you are the perfecter and pioneer of our faith. In Jesus' name, we give you this time. Amen. So whenever we look at a portion of scripture, it would do us well to look at the context from which it was written before we make any misapplications to our lives. And so if we look at the book of Hebrews as a whole, there is no consensus as to who wrote it. The author is unknown. There are people who believe that the Apostle Paul wrote it, or perhaps it was one of his co-laborers in Christ, maybe Barnabas or Apollos. What we do know and what we have agreed upon is that whoever wrote it had a first-hand relationship and first-hand encounters with the original apostles of Jesus. So he was directly related to them in some way. With regards to the audience and for who this letter was written, we don't know specifically either who it was written for. We do, however, know that the readers who were intended to read this were facing persecution for their faith in Jesus. And so the author said to write this letter for two purposes. First, to reiterate the sovereignty of Jesus and to remind the readers that he is faithful to be followed. And then secondly, to encourage the readers to hold fast to their faith in Jesus and to endure all the way to their end and to not give up hope. And so I'd like us now to look at the passage that I read again, but I'd like us to go section by section and see what we can glean from each of these sections for our lives. Verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, let's stop there for now. Who is this cloud? What is this cloud of witnesses that the author is talking about? If we look at the chapter that immediately precedes this, chapter 11, the author lists a whole bunch of people in the Bible, a whole bunch of people in the Old Testament, a whole bunch of figures of faith who were steadfast in their faith in God throughout their whole lives. Yes, they messed up. Yes, they had some mistakes, but ultimately they stuck with God to the end. And so he gives a brief summary of each of these people to be an example for us. We can go ahead and read the longer accounts or just remember them to give us inspiration and encouragement for our walks of faith. He lists about 18 of these, but the Greek word that is used here, cloud, actually refers to a great number. It's way more than 18. And so what we, what we are meant to take here is that the author didn't mean that there's only 18. He just had time for 18, or he only had enough space on his parchment for 18. There is a great wealth of people who have come before us, who have run the race of faith for us to look to. It can also mean people today in our lives. So who are you inspired by in faith? Who 
gives you an old kick in the behind when you're trailing and need someone to encourage you. There are people that we can look to in our lives that will inspire us to move forward when times get tough, and times are going to get tough. So if there's one thing that I want you to take away today, it's this, and it's probably the most important principle I will share today, is that you cannot run your life alone. You cannot run your race of faith alone. No marathon, no race is meant to be done alone. Even marathon runners have a team. They have someone training them or multiple trainers. They have a pace setter who runs with them. They have a team on the sidelines waiting to help intercept at any time based on whatever the runner needs. Nobody decides to run a marathon without training, without a team, and expects to finish well. It's a recipe for disaster. You need people in your life if you're going to run a race. I'd like to indulge you with another personal story, if you will. Um, some of you know that Pastor Terry, some of you might not know, but Pastor Terry is an avid backpacker. He loves to go out in the wild. Sometimes he shares about it. He hears from the Lord. He reads. He prays. He just plans. He just experiences the Lord out there. And he goes away for five days at a time. And he invites um, some of the staff and even some of the leaders and congregation members have gone with him too. I have gone a number of times with Pastor Terry. I was never a backpacker, but I learned. And it's a wonderful experience, also a terrible experience. And the second one I went on was to Lake Hyatt. I believe it was 14 miles. You carry like a 45 pound back, uh, pack on your back. And um, it was probably one of the worst experiences of my life. And I probably, I was this close to never ever hiking ever again. Uh, but I did hike again after that. There was a happy ending. I'll spoil it. There's the section in the beginning of the hike, though, called Killer Hill. Lovely name for something at the start of a hike. But after Killer Hill comes Laos Mountain, which is even higher and even worse than Killer Hill. I don't know why they don't switch the names up. But basically, there were four of us. Pastor Terry and the two other guys are at the top of Laos Mountain already. And I am trailing way behind. I haven't even started the climb. And I slip. And I fall down. And I'm sitting in the dirt. And I'm crying my silent tears. They're silent and they're invisible because I didn't have any water left in my body because I had sweated it all out. If I hadn't sweated it all out, you can be sure there would be tears crawling down my face. But I was just not having it. I was done. I wanted to be home. I did not like being there. So I hid behind a rock so they wouldn't see me because I was all embarrassed. And I just took a moment to gather myself. And then I got up and I climbed the rest of the mountain. I finally reached the top. They've all been sitting there for about 20, 30 minutes. And I sit down on a rock. And Pastor Terry says, no, Vincent, don't sit down. We've got to keep going. And I look at him. And I'm like, I just got here. He was like, well, we've been waiting for 30 minutes. We've got to go. And I'm like, I'm thirsty. And he said, there's a lake right there. We're going to go and get that lake. We'll take a break there. Come on. And I looked at him. And I was so livid. I had so many things running through my head. And I just looked at him. And I said, you're the worst. And I pulled out my water. And I drank it anyway. You do not get to tell me when I drink water. Anyway. Everybody laughed. It has gone down in the legends of backpacking. It's one of PT's favorite moments because I called the lead pastor the worst. That, that's what I was thinking, and I'm pretty honest on these hikes. Anyway, I drank my water. We came to an agreement and an understanding, and then we continued. And there was a lake, and we rested, and I got some water. Anyway, we were there for five days. Eventually, when we made it, I fell asleep under a tree for about an hour in the blazing hot sun because I was just exhausted. And at some point, I used my rage and anger to fuel me to finish this race. Use what you got, right? On the way back, Pastor Terry knew I needed some help making it all the way to the end. So he came up with a plan, which was to help me keep pace. So I was not allowed in the back. I had to go third. Pastor Terry led the way. Then there was someone behind him, and I was to go next. And there was someone behind me. And my task was to look at the guy's feet in front of me and keep pace with him. Every time he takes a step, I must take a step. I must always be able to see his feet. I must never lose pace. And if I did start to trail, if I did start to fall back, the guy behind me would push me and gently encourage me and say, keep going, keep going. And it worked. I was able to keep focus on his uh, pace. And I kept going and I kept going. Now. I did want to take breaks, and I did have more choice words to share with Pastor Terry, and we did argue, and I did complain most of the way, but I made it, and I kept pace, and we all arrived on the bottom together. And what I learned in that moment is that it is a very different experience when you do something by yourself versus when you do it with people around you. 
having that team around me, someone behind me and someone in front of me to help me keep pace, to stay on target, to not get distracted and to not fall behind was really helpful. And so that's what we need in our lives. Um, another brief story, and this is a little more serious, but when my wife Alita passed away and I was to care for our son Hosea, this community of Cornerstone rallied so much behind me and Hosea. People did our laundry, people made food for us, people took Hosea and cared for him, even for a week at a time when I just collapsed on the floor and was like, I can't do this anymore. Um, even right now, people still care for us, and Hosea is with someone right now while I'm recording this message. And so what I learned in that season is that oftentimes I think we don't want to ask for help. We don't want to be a hindrance to someone. We don't want to be a bother to them. Or maybe we're a little prideful because we think, you know, this isn't that hard. I should have it more together and people respect me because I'm strong and I should have it together. So we don't want to ask for help and show people that we're weak. And sometimes also um, we're, we're, we're afraid of the rejection. They might say no. It's okay for people to say no. It doesn't mean they don't love you. And so what I learned is though, people who love us want to help us. And sometimes they need to be told what it is that can help us. So don't be afraid to ask people for help. Don't be afraid to let people into your life. Let go of that pride that says you have to be strong. Let go of the fear of rejection. Just because they can't help you now doesn't mean they don't want to help you. Ask people to help you. Don't withhold the blessing that's in it for them to be of assistance because of your pride or your fear. And if you don't have anyone in your life, that's exactly one of the reasons this church exists, to provide you with those people. First, we will point you to Jesus who is with you every step of the way, but also we can come alongside you tangibly. Come and find someone. Find someone in this building. Find someone online who you can invite to be part of your life. That's what we're here for. And we will gladly say yes and be with you in this race if you need it. You are not alone. You do not have to do this alone. The next part of the Hebrew scripture says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now, if you're going to do a marathon, you go with as little things to carry as possible. Just your water and the bare necessities and maybe a time or whatever. You don't go lagging this, lugging this 50 pound bag, wheelie bag behind you while you run. That's like, why would you do that? Like, no. But that's what we do in our lives, even unknowingly. We carry things that we shouldn't. There are two things that the author of Hebrews mentions we need to let go of. We need to rid ourselves of first, everything that hinders us, and second, the sin that entangles us. And so when it comes to the things that hinder us, I think one of the things to remember is that things that hinder us aren't necessarily sinful things. Um, there are two separate categories. They can be the same, which we will find out soon, but there are things in life that aren't necessarily sins, sins but still slow us down. And so we need to take stock of our lives and see what it is that is slowing us down and hindering us. Some of it is baggage from our past that we carry with us every day. Low self-esteem because of the way we were raised, unforgiveness, uh, unresolved anger, bitterness, abuse, dysfunction, our anxieties, small and large. We carry these things every day, but the Lord is inviting us to let it go and to own the identity that we are in him, a beloved child of God. What also hinders us are distractions. Now, if you were to run a marathon through uh, just an entire race where on either side of you are spas and relaxation centers and foot massages or restaurants that blow out the aroma of bacon cheeseburgers or freshly baked chocolate cupcakes, that would be a terrible race to run. Those would be very big hindrances that will make us want to stop running and just go and get a foot massage and a bacon burger already. And just like that, it's hard to run the race of life and our faith with all the distractions that are in our way. Again, sometimes just because of the nature of our busy lives and sometimes because of what we choose to occupy our time with. Things like our work and our school and our life schedules, which are not necessarily a bad thing, but we get busy. Social engagements, even thing, times when we uh, 
have for ourselves to refresh ourselves and have some solo retreats. Social media, which has many positives, like telling you when there's a Lord of the Rings virtual marathon, or, but they can be time sucks, like I know they are for me. Games, TV, music, all the things that I like to entertain myself with, which are not necessarily bad, but again, if we let all of these things become so distracting in our lives that we leave no time for Jesus and to encourage ourselves spiritually, then they become hindrances in our lives and we need to let go of them. Or at the very least, like not carry 50 pounds of them, but maybe go to 20 pounds, you know, or 45, just work your way down. And then the other sort of thing that we are to let go when we run a race is the sin that entangles us, according to the author of Hebrews. Now, the Greek word entangles has no specific English translation, and it can have four different meanings or translations. It can mean sin that is easily avoided, sin that is admired, sin that is ensnaring, or sin that is dangerous. And so when we run this race of life, when we walk our faith walk, we must lay aside all of our sins that are easily avoided. God will provide an out. We must lay aside all sins that are admired or desired or that we want. Sin is enticing and we're going to want it and it's going to feel good, good, but we need to let go of it because we need to lay aside sins that are ultimately trapping. They will trap us and will not let us go. We need to lay aside sins that are dangerous, that are ultimately become harmful for us. You see, when we sin, the more we sin, the more it separates us from God and the harder it is to finish our race. It becomes baggage that we put on our already heavy lives and it becomes hard to run. It becomes hard to walk eventually. Eventually, we're just standing still at a loss of how to move forward in our faith with God. Are you carrying too much? Do you need to let go of a sin that is ensnaring you? Do you need to let go of something? The Lord is inviting you to let go of all these things. That's the good news. Jesus is like Southwest Airlines. He checks in all of our baggage for free, past, present, and future. All we have to do is put it on the conveyor belt of faith, and he takes it. The next section of the Hebrews passage says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. For us. Each of us has our own race to run. It does not do us well to compare our race with that of another. If we focus too much on the lane next to us and the person running next to us, we can be disillusioned and disenfranchised and disheartened. Why do they only have to run five miles and I have 5,000? You know, I don't know. That's the race that you were put in. Only the Lord knows why. But you have been given and will be given everything you need to finish your race. Let's not compare our races to the race of others. Now, the Greek word for race is agona. I'm not Greek. I don't know how to say that properly. You can ask Pastor Stephen, who is Greek, for the correct translation. But that word that is used for race is usually used for um, the word conflict or struggles of many kinds. And so what the author is getting at here is that this race, what he's comparing to, this race of our lives, is going to be hard. There are going to be struggles. It's going to be difficult. There are going to be many, many hardships that come our way. And it's going to be like a race that we have to overcome. Each of us is given a very specific race, a very specific battle, a very specific struggle to overcome. And it says in that phrase in the scripture, with perseverance or with endurance. And now the Greek word for that is hupomone. Again, I don't speak Greek. I don't know the pronunciation. Ask Pastor Stephen. But hupomone is not passive. It's not a passive word. It is an active determination. And I found this description online that I think is beautiful, and I'd like to read it to you because it's better than I could ever write. It says, the Greek word hupomone is normally translated patience or endurance, but there is no single English word that fully captures its rich meaning. 
In Greek literature, it was used to describe the endurance of a man forced into labor against his will, but worked on. The endurance of a man who suffered the sting of grief, but continued on. The endurance of a soldier who fought a losing battle, but battled on. It was also used to describe a plant living in an inhospitable environment against all odds. You've probably seen those little shoots stubbornly lifting their leafy heads to the sun. What you're seeing is hupomone, staying power. Hupomone is not simply the patience which waits passively for the storm to pass. It is the spirit which stares down the storm. It is the spirit which bears difficulty, not with resignation, but with blazing hope because it knows glory is coming. Hupomone is not the grim patience that waits for the end, but the radiant patient that hopes for a new beginning. Hupomone is the background upon which courage and glory are painted. Hupomone is what keeps your feet stubbornly, joyfully plodding on against the wind. Hupomone is what transforms the hardest trials into quests for victory. Hupomone is that grit and determination within Christians in the first century that enabled them to deny Caesar as Lord and affirm Jesus as Lord. And so how do we do this? How do we cultivate hupomone? The success of any race is largely determined by what the runner focuses on. And the next portion of that scripture passage tells us what to focus on. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Just like the cloud of witnesses that the author listed in verse 11 of Hebrews, Jesus is the perfect, most ultimate witness for us in this race to endure. He ran his race. He endured it. He made it. So he knows what we're going through. He knows what it's like. He suffered worse than us and worse than we ever will. And he still made it to the end. So he gets it. And not only that, but he runs with us and he will enter our race with us every step of the way as well, all over again. He loves us that much. Charles Spurgeon says this, he stands with us at the starting point and earnestly says to us, not run, but let us run. The apostle himself is at our side as a runner. Jesus steps into our race and runs with us every step of the way. And what got Jesus through? All of the trials, all of the tribulation, all of the torture, all of the suffering, and all of the pain that he endured in his race. It was the joy of what was to come. The prize of reconciling us to the Father and of being glorified for eternity in heaven was greater than any trial he was going to endure here on earth. And he never forgot that. And so we need to remember this too. Our race has an end. There is a reward. There is a prize. It's heaven. If there were no end to our life, if there were no end to our race that resulted in heaven, an ultimate prize, then it would just be torture. There would be no point in running. But there is an end. We get to be with Jesus forever in heaven. That's what we're striving towards. That's the hope we live for, we endure by, we endure for. And not only that, but the hardest part of our race is actually already done. Running this race is hard, but can you imagine if we ran all the way to the end, that we make it to the other side and God is like, nice job running, but you're still not holy and worthy enough to enter, sorry. That's not how it works. Jesus has made us worthy. He has made us holy by his sacrifice on the cross. 
That part is already done. That's the hardest thing. All we need to do is reach the end. And then Jesus will be there at the pearly gates waiting with the cloud of witness to put a medal of salvation and sanctification over our shoulders. We just need to make it to the end. Next part of the verse. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I think sometimes when we think of marathon runners or great achievements or endurance, we think of these big momentous occasions with everybody cheering and this public victory and everything is just rah, 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 full of energy and life. But that's not how life usually goes. I think more often than not, we struggle. More often than not, we fall down. More often than not, this is hard. And courage doesn't necessarily look like, yeah! I think courage sometimes is just picking ourselves up and trying again. Like my favorite quote says, courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the little voice at the end of the day that says, I'll try again tomorrow. I felt that many times. There have many times I've gone to bed saying, I don't want to fall asleep tonight because I do not have enough energy to get through tomorrow. I do not have enough in me to start a whole new day again. But I go to sleep, I wake up, I pray, and I do it. And that's what a lot of life feels like to us. And maybe we're stuck in a rut like that and we don't see the end. That's true courage. That's true perseverance. Getting up and continuing to walk. You might not feel like you're making any progress. You might feel like you mess up too many times. You might not feel like you don't have it in you, but you do. As long as you keep going, as long as you keep pressing forward, you are making progress. Jesus will not abandon you. He will not leave you in those places. So get up and keep going. Let's not give up. Let's get up and try again. When we fall, we get up and we try again. Let's surround ourselves with people who can encourage us when times get tough and bleak and we don't think we can go again and they need to lift us up and drag us unwillingly. Let's find those people to do it. Let's throw aside every baggage that we've carried from the past, every worry for the future that we don't need to have, every sin that we actively engage ourselves in, and even the ones that we aren't aware of that we need to ask the Lord to reveal ourselves. Let's throw away everything that is hindering us from living a full, engaged life in Christ. Let's be ready for the struggle and the pain that will come, it will, and let's endure it with Jesus every step of the way, but let's never lose sight of Jesus who's done it before, and show us the way and also the glory that is to come, that is waiting for us if we reach that finish line. In a moment, the band is going to come up and they're going to sing a closing song called I Will Run that you can sit with and reflect upon and encourage you to continue running your race with endurance. And then Pastor Terry will close us out with a brief word of encouragement. I'd also like to remind our church family that this is the time of giving. Uh, thank you for being so faithful in your tithes and offerings that the Lord calls us to and invites us to. That is really a blessing more for us than it is for him. Um, you can give online through the app, on our website. You can mail it in, whatever you prefer. Uh, if you are not part of the community or this is your first time joining us, do not feel any pressure at all to do so. We love you. Uh, with all of that, I'd love to pray to close our time here together. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you first and foremost that you are the perfecter and pioneer of our faith. Thank you that you came, you endured so much, and you showed us the way forward for us to endure as well. Thank you that you know what we are going through. Thank you that you are willing to step into our pain and carry us through to that finish line if that's what it takes. 
Thank you that you will not abandon us. I pray that we can strip aside every sin that is holding us back from fullness in you. I pray that we can strip aside every baggage from the past that has been thrown at us that we haven't released at your feet. I pray that we can let go of every anxiety of the future and every worry that we have that we carry needlessly. I pray that you can bring into our lives those people that will be the gentle word of encouragement, that can lift us in their arms and gently hold us as we take a few steps. I pray also for those people in our lives that can give us a big jolt of energy and kick in the butt when we need it. I pray that you surround us with a witness, a cloud of witnesses, Lord. I pray that you bring those people into our lives. You know what we need. And I pray also that we can be that person to those in our lives or to someone we haven't even met yet. And above all, Lord, I pray that we do not give up. I pray that you fill us with your supernatural power, with your Holy Spirit filling every pore and every fiber of our being, that when our muscles give out, when our flesh gives out, our spirit carries on, that it lifts every step we take and every step we put down so that we reach that finish line and enter into the glory and amazing blessing and promise that you have in us, Lord. Let us not lose sight of what you have for us. Let us not throw that away because of what is coming our way in terms of pain or struggle or temporary hardship, Lord. Give us your grace to endure. Give us your love, your presence, your peace, and your power. In Jesus' name, amen.
Oh, I will run. Yeah, the Lord wants to teach us how to run this race of faith with patience, with endurance, and with joy. We need to keep our eyes though on Jesus. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He showed us how it's done. Yeah. I just want you to remember, as you're running this life of faith, as you're running in this life, which is a gift, let's welcome the Lord into that race. Let's run well. Let's run as one loved. That's what you are. You are so loved. And my prayer for you is that he would keep you. I say this, I don't think I can ever say this too much. My prayer is that he would keep you in your spirit. And I pray that for me too. In your soul, in your mind, in your thinking patterns, and in your body, some of us need a touch. May he keep you in every way, in Jesus' name.